Thank you. Well, history has its challenges, of course. Back in the, the middle 1960s, there was quite a bit of pressure put on the National Research Council to build a large radio telescope and set up a, a national observatory. And uh, Norm Broughton, Arthur Covington spoke to McKinley. McKinley sent a memo to the president of NRC, Dr. Stacy. Let's get going on an observatory. Uh, and interestingly enough, there was a parallel funding going on to try to obtain an observatory uh, out here in British Columbia. And the two culminated pretty much at the same time, which was very fortunate uh, in those days. Lots of money available. Um, so site selection took place. And uh, several of the people that worked on that from the universities are listed here, McCray, Harrower, and Yen. And construction started in 1959 to build the observatory. Now, of course, one of the key instruments there was the solar telescope. And Ken Tapping has talked a lot about that. Um, we had, uh, this was called Site 2. And we had two telescopes there. The one on the left was a, a calibration horn. It was used to uh, make absolute flux density measurements of some of the strong sources. The one on the right is a 10 meter telescope. And it was used at uh, 3,200 megahertz for a number of projects. And this was the solar compound interferometer for getting high resolution one dimensional scans of the sun. Now, this is one of my favorite photos of the completed Algonquin 46 meter telescope. Uh, I'm indebted to uh, Bob Hayward for this. Came via Jack Locke, one of Jack's photos. It's actually recognized at the bottom there. Uh, there were other telescopes, too, that uh, were present. And uh, some of them were low-frequency telescopes. Bob McNary at uh, what we called Site 1B. And the University of Toronto got into the act very early on. And they built a 60-foot antenna and a sugar scoop antenna. And of course, here are the two people to whom we're indebted for the solar records. I love this scan. This is a transit of uh, Cygnus. And uh, this is Cygnus A over here. And this is Cygnus X. And you can see how difficult it is when you're using a rather wide beam to, to sort out uh, the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. And it was to the credit of uh, Norm Broughton and Wilf Med that they managed to do this and uh, do it for four sources. The picture on the left is Norm Broughton in his later years. He developed a wonderful beard. <laughs> so what, what instrument is making that scan? Uh, that scan was made with the calibration horn, the, uh, the one like the one at Bell that was yeah, used that, to. I think that's Garfield. Pardon? That's Garfield. That one? Yeah, 59 would be too early for the. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're right. It is Glass Hill. You're right. This is uh, observations made by Lloyd Higgs and colleagues using the 10 meter telescope at 3200. And this is an observation covering quite a large chunk of sky, something like 11 degrees on the side, uh, looking at uh, Cygnus X. This is. Oh, sorry, me. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one of Lloyd's favorite sources in there was called the Gamma Cygni source. Uh, a, a, a supernova remnant. One of the first contour maps we made was uh, done by Lauren Doherty. Um, and this is W51. W51 turns out to be looking down uh, one of the other arms, Sagittarius arm, I believe. And there's a lot of point sources in there, which are all thermal. Um, and there's a very broad extended source, which uh, it took a little effort to bring that out, but it, it was there, definitely. And uh, the authors felt this was also a thermal source. 
The Vermilion River Observatory, which you'll hear more about a little later, did a survey of sources. Uh, and VRO 4222.01 was one of these. It turned out to have a rather unusual spectrum for the time. It wasn't detected at 178, but it got quite strong around 10 Janskys, up around uh, centimeter wavelengths. And Brian, Andrew, and I decided to uh, try and uh, observe this and see what we could learn about this source. Uh, we identified it optically. It was a, uh, a 14th magnitude object on the Palomar Sky Surveys. And uh, John Schmidt at University of Toronto realized that this thing already had a name. It was called BL Lacerte, BL Lac. And uh, so this was the identification of BL Lac as a radio source. Um, at ARO, we carried out a very large, long time scale survey of variable radio sources at 2.8 and 4.5 and centimeters. And this was what we found that uh, this source, VRO 2242 was doing. The um, time is the lower axis, and flux density, the uh, vertical axis. And the dark uh, spots are at 4.5 centimeters. The lighter spots are at 2.8. So pretty well every burst that occurred there was stronger at 2.8. And uh, it was a very active source for the time. Extragalactic sources generally varied on a scale of uh, one or maybe a, one burst a year. So this was really quite active. And uh, this was one of many sources that were observed in the variable source survey. And there was a tendency for uh, the sources to all show uh, variability where the, the increment in flux density was proportional to lambda to the minus 0 0.4. Um, Joseph Fletcher is going to talk more about the VLI experience, VLBI experience at ARO, but this is uh, Tom Legg and his colleagues did a, a paper on the structure of one of the components of 3C273. And the thing to notice here that uh, these were taken at four separate times using multiple baselines. Um, oops. The source on the left is very strong, but notice as time goes by, it spreads out on the left-hand side. And Tom and his colleagues found that the other two sources remained the same, their ratio remained the same, but it was the addition of the third guy that caused all the variability in the uh, continuum measurements of that source. Uh, David Fork <coughs> did some work with uh, his colleague uh, Yi, um, and he showed that if you use closure phase, you could actually take an object as complex as the one on the left and produce something pretty good resemblance of it on, on the right. And Alan Yen and many, many VLI, VLBI observers realized that you could do VLBI in real time if you used uh, a satellite, a communications satellite. And so they used, I think it was the Hermes satellite, to, uh, to show that this was viable and uh, made the cover of science. Um, they found that uh, you get a wider bandwidth and uh, better sensitivity as a result. You didn't need all those tape recorders. And uh, <coughs> it, it, it had some very nice uh, possibilities. Jacques Vallée and Phil Kronberg did work on linear polarization. Um, and this is just a, a distribution of the um, percentage polarizations at uh, 2.2 centimeters, the top uh, chart, and the bottom one, the distribution at uh, 4.5. And the thing I want you to notice there is that most of these sources had polarizations uh, sort of less than 4% percent, percent, uh, wise, but there were some as high as 13%. Uh, so, And uh, Jacques as well did work on uh, <coughs> rotation measures in uh, the very large area of sky involving the gum nebula. And uh, this appears to be a relatively local structure in the galactic field uh, due to uh, this gum nebula area. <coughs> 
Now, Chris Pert and Sun Kwok and Paul Feldman found that there were many objects in the sky that, that varied even more rapidly than uh, uh, VRO 4222.01. One of these was uh, HM Sajidi. Um, Phil and Martine Normanda uh, measured many rotation measures and plotted them on this galactic uh, coordinates. The large black objects have positive rotation measures. The open circles are negative rotation measures. And you can see that they tend to cluster in areas uh, where over a large area you have similar rotation measures. And uh, there didn't seem to be any large scale reversals of magnetic field outside of our own arm. But once you got inside, uh, you did get uh, variations of the direction of the magnetic field. Recombination lines, you could observe at 85 alpha, hydrogen recombination lines, helium recombination lines. Here's some work on the Orion Nebula. Uh, Lloyd Higgs was involved with this, as well as Lauren and myself. And uh, we got good, strong lines, of course, on Orion. We looked at several different positions in the nebula and found that the, um, the ratio of the helium line to the carbon line um, fell off fairly sharply as you moved towards the northeast of the nebula, and that there was a, a gradient of velocity across the nebula as well. Now, this is a little story that uh, I just want to go into in a little bit of detail, the cyanopolyene story. At that time, the Hertzberg Institute was in the process of uh, being thought about, and uh, it was a good idea to collaborate with the people in the spectroscopy section to see what you could do in terms of observing molecular spectral lines. And so programs were initiated with uh, Takeshi Oka, who was one of the spectroscopists. And he had a, a colleague named Harry Croto. Harry was uh, a Brit who had come over to Hertzberg's group and worked for a number of years. And then uh, he'd gone back to Britain. And he'd just created a substance in the lab called HC5N, a linear molecule. And uh, he said, well, why don't you guys try and look for this in interstellar space. So we did. We went to Sagittarius B2. And uh, the large line in the center there is the 4 to 3 transition of HC5N. So this was the first time this had been detected. And so we thought, let's look around, see where else we can find this stuff. And uh, we looked in the dark clouds in Taurus. And uh, in particular, on this side right in here, there's a little area. It was called Hylas's Cloud 2, and it had other names. And there was a filament part of it called TMC1. And in TMC1, we find the 4 3 line splits up into three hyperfine components. Uh, very nice uh, possibility of seeing all three. Uh, and we map that uh, in, in the uh, TMC1. And the dashed lines represent the mapping of HC5N. We also mapped ammonia using the Algonquin telescope. And uh, the thing I want to stress here is that the two are anti-correlated in the sense that the peak of the uh, HC5N is here, whereas that's a minimum in the ammonia. And the ammonia is much stronger up further north, where there's very little HC5N. Well, uh, Harry decided it was a good idea to continue this. And so he had a grad student back at Sussex, and he said, Get to work and stick two more carbons into this molecule. See if you can make HC7N. So this lab student, uh, or the, uh, he's a grad student, he beavered away for a long time. And he did manage to do that. And the day before we went to the telescope, I think we, we got the information on what frequencies to use to search for HC7N. This was very fresh off the lab. Uh, we looked, and sure enough, in TMC1, there was a spectral line from HC7N. And uh, we confirmed it later with uh, another line, which we observed at Haystack. Uh, 
Now, if you can put in two more, you get HC9N. Uh, so they worked hard at this at Sussex, but uh, they just couldn't do it. And so somebody had the idea, and I think it was Takeshi Oka. Well, we know quite a bit about this family. Let's see if we can extrapolate the molecular constants of the lower uh, number of carbon to see if we can estimate what the rotation constant would be for HC9N. And that was done. And we arranged to have simultaneous observations at ARO on the 46 meter telescope and also uh, at Green Bank on the 140 foot uh, over a four day period. And sure enough, we detected two lines of HC9N. These were detected in interstellar space before the substance was made on the Earth. And uh, so we were quite pleased about this. This was the heaviest interstellar molecule known at the time. Uh, that's what it looks like. You can imagine billions of those sitting out there rotating, changing their rotation, right? Sending off little packets of uh, information to the radio telescope. Well, why the simultaneous observations? Um, we thought it would be a good thing because we didn't really know for sure what the rotation constant was. And so we scanned a little bit in frequency just in case our estimate was off. And we wanted to be able to do it all at one time. And, and it would be more convincing if you got at least a couple of lines. Um, whoops. This is Harry Crotto. Um, Harry went on to do a lot more work in, in carbon uh, theory. In fact, he uh, was one of the group that discovered Buckminster Fullerene. And uh, he and his colleagues ultimately received the Nobel Prize for this. And he was knighted, in fact. He came Sir Harry Croto. So uh, we knew him when. Um, I'll just skip over this one. Uh, University of Toronto profs. We had several of them there. And there were probably others as well. Uh, and there's Ernie. Yeah, he worked on SS433. And again, he found that that was a variable object. And uh, it had brightness temperatures as, as high as uh, oh, greater than 10 to the seventh uh, Kelvins. Cygnus X3. That was a very spectacular source that uh, Phil Gregory and Vic Hughes and Andy Woodsworth and Ernie all worked on. and. Uh, you can see that uh, on periods of time as short as a day, it had very spectacular variations. And so a galactic patrol was mounted to, to look for other sources like this. <coughs> a, a lot of grad students uh, observed at ARO. Here are some from Toronto. Um, Ernie and Carl looked at uh, 25 flux density variables. And they found that. Uh, Several of them actually varied in polarization angle, uh, which is the top image, and uh, in polarization percentage, which is the bottom image. Lauren Brown um, actually decided to push the telescope to the limit. And he put a 35 gigahertz receiver on the 46 meter telescope. Now, the efficiency was getting kind of low at this point, but there was a good beam at uh, uh, a resolution of about one minute of arc. And he looked at Cas A. And he was able to resolve Cas A with a single beam, uh, finding the uh, intense region here and uh, down below. Sadly, Lauren Brown passed away not long after this work was done. So he was a, a real pioneer in Canadian millimeter wavelength radio astronomy. Uh, it's too bad he didn't survive longer. We had people from York, Wayne Cannon and Chris Purton, and probably others as well. Here's Wayne. He, uh, he was our geodetic specialist. And he did a lot of work on uh, things related to the Earth, such as the notation of the Earth's axis using the LBI. Um, Vic Hughes at Queens, and also Mike Kestevin, whose name should be on there as well. Uh, observed at ARO. And here are some grad students who also observed at ARO. Uh, 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, here's Dick Butler. Uh, he, he looked at NRO 591 and 593 at three different uh, frequencies. Uh, David Routledge produced this map of the galactic plane at uh, nine, well, 10 centimeters, I guess. Covered quite an extensive region from 32 to 49. This is only a partial uh, view of that map. But uh, a lot of work went into that. Um, we actually had a couple of people from UBC who observed. Uh, Bill McCutcheon, Bill Shooter. They were looking at uh, pulsars to see whether the amplitude of the pulsars varied uh, in any periodic fashion. And they found that it didn't over long periods of time, but in a couple out of the four, it did over uh, short periods of time. Russ Taylor and Phil Gregory looked at this object, and they found that uh, it had a period periodic variability with a period of 26.52 plus or minus 0.04 days. So a quite impressive object. They, uh, they thought that uh, this might have actually been uh, some sort of binary model, binary object. And we had summer students, and, and some of those became uh, well-known radio astronomers. Tony and Joan and Dave Fort, Rick Purley, and there were others as well. But as, as time went on and uh, we got into the early 1980s, use of the telescope started to diminish from the university community. Our, our, our receivers were no longer competitive with some of the others available. The resolution was not really competitive with some of the others. and so. The idea was put forth, let's resurface the telescope, let's make it good for millimeter wavelengths. And so a lot of work was put into studying the parameters of the telescope, how well it would do this. And uh, it was concluded this was a good thing to do. Um, Casca backed it. Um, it was sold to uh, the, uh, the people in NRC management, and they backed it. In fact, they granted $10 million for the project. Um, and uh, a lot of work was done here. We started to work on a seven millimeter receiver, another on a three millimeter receiver in the receiver group. Uh, and I'm gonna leave Bob Hayward to complete the story of what happened to that project. How did we get the money for resurfacing? <laughs> Thank you very much. Ha, ha, ha. 